and welcome to this episode of Artsably in Conversation. My name is Diane Collin. This series presents artists, academics, and project leaders who dedicate their time and energy to a better accessibility for people with disabilities in the arts. You can find more of these episodes on our website, artsably.com, which is spelled A-R-T-S-A-B-L-Y.com. Today, Art is in conversation with Rory McLeod, Artistic and Executive Director of Xenia Concerts, an organization that improves access to concerts to audiences with autism and other kinds of disabilities. For lots of music lovers, their favorite way to experience music is live, in concert. But not everyone can access live arts events. Sometimes there are physical, financial, social, and other barriers in the way. From getting information, to buying a ticket, to accessing the venue and enjoying the concert environment, all of these can create hurdles, especially for neurodivergent, deaf, and disabled folks. But it doesn't have to be that way. At Xenia Concerts, we work hard to meet your accessibility needs so that you can enjoy amazing live musical experiences with incredible musicians in an environment where your needs are met and you can be yourself. All of our concerts are family friendly and we welcome neurodivergent, disabled, deaf and hard of hearing attendees. We call them adaptive concerts because they're designed to adapt to your needs. Xenia concerts take place in wheelchair accessible venues set up so that you can move around freely, take a quiet break, or even dance along to the music. Our venue guides show you what to expect and give you important accessibility information. We also provide other supports like fidget toys, therapy dogs, musical ASL interpretation, and visual aids at many of our concerts. Whatever your needs, whatever your age, and however you express yourself, we want you to relax and enjoy the music when you're at a Xenia concert. As one of our guests told us, it's an amazing experience for the whole family. Just be yourself. To learn more about our upcoming events or to join our mailing list, visit xeniaconcerts.com. See you soon. The mission of Xenia Concerts is to provide music and arts performances and presentations in an environment that is welcoming of people who may not be able to attend other events due to mental, financial or physical barriers. For example, we present sensory friendly concerts that welcome children and families affected by autism spectrum disorder. We also present concerts that are accessible for people living with dementia. Any community that self-identifies as not having equal access to the arts is a community that we want to work with to create accessible arts opportunities. We take for granted, I think, the ability to just show up somewhere and, and have an experience and to have, you know, an artistic evening um, and not everyone can actually do that. I absolutely loved it. I said to my friend I could stay another hour and listen to this. It was beautiful. I was really hoping that our Sunshine Seniors would be able to forget about their problems for an hour or so and enjoy the music, get lost in the music. And I think that we achieved that. Everybody just looked on a level of bliss. It is very much the big issue is no two people are alike in terms of what the sensitivities are or how they react to them. The setup here has been nice, uh, although we've never had to use it, just knowing that there's a quiet area around the corner, for instance, is a big plus. Uh, I think the second concert we came to in one of the feedback forums realized that the washrooms, for instance, have blow dryers. 
which is a horror show for some of the kids going in, they can't tolerate them. It was mentioned in the feedback form, next concert and since, and there's always been paper towels laid out. So they've been very conscious of some of the sensitivities of the audience to try and, and mitigate a lot of the things that will bother them. Responding to accessibility issues that our audience members might have is really at the core of what Xenia does. In a way, we are sort of specialty arts curators. So when we hear from a family or another person that there's an aspect of our concert that is not that welcoming for them and may not be welcoming for others as well, we fix it right away. We're happy to do that. That is what makes our concerts work and what makes them successful. For me as a performer, the whole point of what I do is to connect with an audience through the music and I want to be able to do that with as many people as possible and there's so many ways to listen to music. and. It's great that we all have this formal concert setting where everyone is very quiet and we just kind of listen in reverence, but it's also great to just be able to move or f feel that you can say anything you want in response or act however you want in response to the music and these concerts give, give a forum for that. Okay, thank you for being here today. I'm here uh, with Rory McLeod from Xenia Concerts. You're the executive director and artistic director of Xenia Concerts. That's right, yeah. We are uh, a concert series that works with the neurodiversity and disability communities to redesign concert experiences and make them more inclusive and accessible for people who face barriers to attending typical events. Okay, thank you. And so when did uh, Xenia Concert start? Xenia Concert started back in 2014, 2015 with the Cecilia String Quartet. Uh, they were inspired by performing in, a, in a, an autism-friendly concert in the US, and they decided that they wanted to bring that experience to Canada. So initially, it was a few concerts run by a string quartet, and their focus really was on the autism community specifically. And what they did um, that I really admire is that they spent about a year consulting with uh, people with lived experience, with healthcare experts, with caregivers of people living with autism um, to design the most autism friendly experience they could. So they started with a series of, uh, I think it was three concerts in their first year, partnered with uh, what is now Meridian Hall, what at the time was the Sony Center. Um, and it's been growing ever since. The response was so positive to, to these concerts that we now present um, upwards of 30 concerts per year. And so behind the concerts, what kind of activities do you lead in Xenia? Yeah, so we've stayed true to that um, that initial approach of being very engaged with the communities that we work with. Um, and, and so a big part of our work is, um, is actually working with people with lived experience and incorporating their suggestions, their design recommendations into, into what we do. Um, we've doubled down on that approach recently by developing a couple of really robust frameworks for community engagement one of which was the ASD Youth Advisory Council, which we ran last year, where we formed a council of five autistic youth, aged 14 to 24, and they basically ran their own meetings to develop design recommendations and design their own autism-friendly concert specifically for youth of their age group. Uh, and we'll be presenting those later this year. Uh, the first one is on July 13th at Meridian Hall, um, our first concert designed by and for autistic youth. And the other uh, community engagement framework that we've developed with the, uh, under the leadership of our accessibility coordinator, Kayla Carter, is called the Accessibility Accelerator. And that is a co-design project in which we're working with six people uh, who identify as either neurodivergent or disabled or both. Um, 
and they are working together over the course of about 18 months to discuss barriers to access in the arts, not just for audiences, but also for arts workers, and then develop resources and design recommendations that Xenia can, concerts can employ in our own concert designs and also share with the broader arts community. I see. And so there is a big team in Xenia right now. We have four staff members. But our team extends way beyond that, of course. So we've got a board of directors with uh, eight very dedicated individuals. We also partner with a lot of different community organizations. So although our core team consists of uh, four staff, myself working full time and three half time uh, employees, we also, um, I mean, I think of our community as extending to hundreds of people, really. Um, including all of the all of the attendees and the caregivers who give feedback on their experiences, including uh, our partners in the Alzheim Alzheimer's and dementia space and in the neurodiversity and disability space, um, and also of course all of the artists that we work with. In the last, I've been with the organization for two and a half years now, and over that time. I would estimate that we've worked with between 50 and 60 different musicians, and they're a big part of our, um, of our team as well, of course. Mm. And I wanted to ask a little bit about yourself. What is your background? So my background, first of all, I think it's worth mentioning that I come to this work as an ally. I don't consider myself, or I don't, don't currently identify as neurodivergent or, or disabled. Uh, and although I do have a, uh, an autoimmune disorder that is at times disabling. I don't currently identify as disabled. Um, so I come at it from the back uh, with a background in music. I play the viola. And so I'm trained in the classical, Western classical music tradition. And I also have about 10, 11 years now of concert design and promotion and presenting experience. Um, back in 2013, I started a series called Pocket Concerts which I now run with my, with my partner in life, uh, Emily Rowe. And the purpose of that concert series was really to bring chamber music and small ensembles into alternative venues, home, mostly homes, but also offices and cafes and places like that, where people feel at ease and can enjoy uh, a concert in a more personal, with a more personal approach, mm -hmm. have the opportunity to interact directly with the artists. We always had some food and wine at those events. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I didn't really think of myself as a designer until maybe three, four years ago when I realized, oh, that's actually what we're doing is we're designing experiences. Um, and that, so I take that um, background in concert design and production uh, and and bring uh, an accessibility and inclusion lens to it at Xenia Concerts. So to help with that work, I actually did a year of studies in inclusive design at OCAD University, um, still on a leave of absence from that, and I hope to complete it at some point. But uh, you know, sometimes you have to, um, have to prioritize uh, one thing over another, and currently I Xenia Concerts is my top priority. Yeah. OK, thank you. I don't know whether I missed anything in there. <laughs> I mean, I have experience, quite a bit of experience as a performer as well, as a violist in orchestral and chamber music settings. So I'm quite familiar with that, especially the classical music world. And because of that, some of the barriers and, and, uh, and problems that, that exist within that world. So you're still performing? Yes, I do still play with the Canadian Opera Company Orchestra, with the National Ballet Orchestra, and in chamber music settings, and the odd gig that comes up here and there. Yeah. OK. Um, I wanted to come back to Xenia. I know you're preparing uh, your concert and your season. Uh, right now, we are way inside the season. But yeah. can you talk about your upcoming concerts and maybe uh, one that you want to describe a little bit more than the others? Sure. Uh, so the, the next, well, we have two really exciting concerts coming up. The first one is our first concert in Vancouver, 
which we're doing in partnership with the Vancouver School of Music, uh, the VSO School of Music and Muse West. Uh, and that's on April 7th, features a jazz trio of musicians who all are on the faculty at the VSO School of Music and very active in the Vancouver community. They're called Triology, and we're working with them to develop a program that's about an hour long, uh, neurodiversity and disability friendly, and we'll have uh, a host of, uh, of sensory supports and accessibility aids at that concert at Pyatt Hall at the VSO School of Music on April 7th, which is a Sunday morning. And then our next um, uh, concert that's part of our flagship series here in Toronto at Meridian Hall on April 27th, we're bringing in a fantastic folk singer songwriter named Rain Hamilton. Uh, Rain is performing with a string trio, so she herself plays guitar and violin she works with a cellist and a bassist. Uh, so, uh, so there'll be vocals and string trio on stage, and also musical ASL interpretation, which uh, at this concert will be performed by Tamika Bullen, uh, a deaf musical ASL performer and poet. Mm. So if, when we attend one of your concerts, how, what is the difference between a concert that we attend at Xenia concert and a traditional concert in the music scene? Well, it's funny because I, our hope, of course, is that gradually those differences will diminish, that other concert series will start to adapt, uh, adopt some of our practices and make their, their experiences more accessible. And that's another big part of what we do, and maybe we can get into that later in the conversation. But at a Xenia concert, you can expect we call them adaptive concerts. Mm -hmm. um, we used to call them sensory friendly concerts, but now that we've expanded some of our, uh, our, our, our vision of who we want to include in, in our approach to accessibility, uh, the term sensory friendly didn't quite capture everything that we do. So adaptive concerts, because they adapt to the needs of the people that attend, um, so some of the things that we take into consideration, obviously the venue and physical, physical access to the venue. So we only present at wheelchair accessible venues with wheelchair accessible gender neutral bathrooms available. But then we take accessibility uh, into account for every aspect of the experience. So we, provide, we have what we call our sensory support table where um, we have fidget toys available. We also have balance cushions for those who need a little bit of extra sensory stimulation when they're uh, to stay engaged. We have weighted blankets and weighted pillows for those who, who need a little bit of a calming, uh, calming effect when they're, when they're listening to stay engaged. And then we think uh, we incorporate accessibility into every aspect of the experience. So, Freedom of movement is a big part of that. Having the, uh, making sure that people know that you can get up and move around if you need to and making space for that. We set up the seating in such a way that the, we have movable chairs, right? We don't have fixed seating in most of our, in most of our concert venues. And that allows us um, to, to move things around as needed and again, adapt uh, to the individual needs of the people who are attending. We also set up multiple areas for people who use mobility devices so that they have the option of sitting in the front or in the middle or in the back as they, as they desire so that people can determine for themselves what the, their best version of that experience might be. So that, that's, those are some of the general accessibility accommodations we make. But then we also work with the artists to make the program neurodiversity friendly. Um, so some of the adaptations we make up to programming are keeping the concert uh, shorter than a typical, especially a typical classical music concert. Normally you would expect a concert to be about two hours long with an intermission and you have to sit quietly and stay in the same chair the whole time. We keep our concerts, the whole experience lasts about an hour and we always incorporate a couple of opportunities to move around during that, during that time. So either a guided stretch break where the musicians guide, uh, guide the audience in some, some movement activities, or a musical um, selection that incorporates movement into, uh, into the musical experience. 
Uh, we also keep our musical selections short uh, for the most part. And we try to vary the, um, the mood or the energy level in the music every five to seven minutes. Um, sometimes we'll incorporate a piece that's 10 minutes long, but we make sure that that piece in itself contains some changes in mood for those who need a little bit of a change in stimulus in order to stay engaged. Um, yeah, so that's a pretty long list, but it's not even comprehensive. There are, there are other things that we do, like visual description from the stage. We have visual aids, so a PowerPoint presentation on either side of the stage so that people can keep track of where they are in the program. We provide venue guides in advance so that people know what to expect uh, when they come to the event and, and how to access the venue. Um, there, there are quite a few things that we do just to allow people to gather the information they need before the event so they know what to expect and, and make themselves comfortable. And uh, during the event, creating that flexibility, again, that adaptability so that if somebody um, has a need that they need to take care of in that moment, they can do it. But I would say the most important adaptation that we, that we make is letting people know that we want them there and that their whatever form of expression it comes naturally to them when they're listening is welcome in that space. So uh, we say, you know, feel free to make noise, get up, move around, or stim. Those behaviors are welcome here and everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that you, your aim is to get that these uh, open concerts uh, to all scenes. Mm. And so what is your, do you have a specific project in mind to try to make that happen? Yes. Um, so we have a number of strategic initiatives that we are working on to, um, to inform others and to share resources that other people can use to make their own events more accessible. A big part of that is our artist training program, which we developed in 2022 and have been running for a year and a half now. So we've trained at least 40 artists at this point. And in the artist training program, which we developed in partnership with the Lotus Center and Dr. Aaron Parks, who is their founder, has 25 years of experience teaching people uh, in the disability community and teaching neurodivergent uh, learners in, in the music world. Um, we offer this training to all of our artists. And it includes three and a half hours of pre-recorded webinars uh, with information about some of the more common diagnoses and some of the traits that they might expect uh, to, to be working with, some, of the, some ways that they can adapt their programming and their musical selections to make their program neurodiversity friendly. We talk about the social model of disability versus the medical model of disability. We talk about the neurodiversity paradigm and, and uh, try to open people's minds up to basically um, changing the way they think about barriers to access as being not uh, that the barriers don't exist within the individuals that we're serving, but rather it's the interaction between the individual and the design of the event that creates a barrier. Um, so the artist training program is a really big part of it. And now with the Accessibility Accelerator, through our social media, through our blog posts, we're working on, uh, on ways to provide information and resources for other arts organizations and artists that want to improve their accessibility practices. So we don't know exactly what shape that will take yet or what shapes the, uh, those resources will take. We're, we're looking at what's out there now, uh, what gaps need to be filled, and how we can fill them in a way that, uh, that is accessible and approachable um, and, and adaptable to different environments and different situations. Is that a new program, or do you already have people who are taking these courses and these the uh, resources. The resources. Uh, so the artist, the artist training program, as I mentioned, has been up and running for a year and a half, and we're developing new webinars. We're currently working towards uh, a webinar that's specifically about dementia-friendly programming. Um, 
and we're uh, obviously collecting feedback from the artists and, and suggestions for how we might improve it and improve those resources. On the, uh, on the side of uh, advising other arts organizations, those practices are, are still emerging. One thing that we're doing is we're con we've consulted with a few organizations and, and basically hired ourselves out as consultants um, to help them develop venue guides and accessib accessibility resources, just to consult on some of their current practices and how they might improve. Um, and of course, we also deliver workshops and do presentations on inclusive concert design. Um, and those have been those have been quite well received as well. I see. Yeah. So thank you. That's that's great information. And of course, all that will be shared on uh, RTB's website so that people can have a look at all these initiatives. I wanted to ask you um, a final question, which is about inspiration. So mm -hmm. if you had one person to think of in terms of inspiration in your work, who would it be and why? Yeah, it's, it's interesting to, to be asked a question about inspiration in relation to, to disability, because I'm very well aware of this, this concept of inspiration porn, which maybe you're familiar with, <laughs> yes. which the idea that, look at what this person with a disability did, isn't it inspiring that they did something that would be considered pretty uh, pretty typical if somebody else had done it. So I'm very cautious uh, of, of around the word inspiration. But what I'm at, what what you're asking, of course, is like who do I see as uh, people who are leading leaders in this space? Where do I um, where do I gain inspiration from? And who are some people that are doing really great work? Um, I mean, aside from you, of course, who are <laughs> showing you. amazing <laughs> leadership in this space uh, through Arts of Lee and through your own uh, approach, which I think is very uh, gentle and nuanced, which I think is important. Um, I think of Gayatri Killings, who we've worked with a few times. Uh, she's an incredible musical ASL performer, also an actor and, and, and just a leader uh, in, the, in the deaf and hard of hearing community. She's just a fantastic performer. And uh, even though I don't sign. I, I'm not fluent in ASL. I only know, you know how to spell my name and that sort of thing. Watching her perform is very moving because you can see the expression and the work and the, and the thought and care that goes into it. Um, and she's just a tremendous advocate for the, for the deaf community as well. I think of uh, Adrian and Antoine, who's a violinist working in, the, in Boston at the moment. He has shown amazing leadership. Uh, he's an, obviously an amazing musician. I think you might know him or know yeah. of him through yes. the very well-named uh, Ramped, uh, which is a, an organization for artists with disabilities, performing artists with disabilities. And Adrian and I uh, went to school together a for a little while, and we connect every once in a while to talk about the work that he's doing. He's done research on adaptive instruments. Um, he does a lot of education work and a lot of equity-focused work in the music world. So I think of Adrian as, a, as a, like a shining example of somebody who is working at that intersection of disability and music. Adrian, I, I really admire his work. It's, uh, it inspired me in hmm. some of my, the workshops uh, with, uh, in, in education and music because he did a fantastic work on all that, uh, that idea that let's find ways to perform, even, with, even if with very few mobility, we can have a computer, uh, what, uh, how, let's work with well, children, children uh, to see how they can perform. And this is really where I want to go. So I, I, I really appreciate that, sharing mm. information about Adrian. Also, Rompt. Yeah. Um, so I'm a pro member of Rompt, and I know these. There, it's a fantastic group of musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, there are tons of opportunities for people. I would say all around the world right now because it's growing, and um, fantastic organization really. And, and this Rompt was actually in my mind when I started 
uh, running Artsibly because mm. they are doing exactly that. They are promoting accessibility in the arts. They are trying to get performers on stage. And um, and yes, and Gatewe also, uh, uh, it's, it's fantastic work what she's doing too. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yes, I, I also want to mention one person who we met recently um, whose name is Ben Lunn, and he's a, he's a, a composer who lives in Glasgow, who's um, working through an organization called Drake Music Scotland. They also, they also have a network of disabled artists uh, living in the UK called the Disability Artists Network. I don't know whether you're familiar with Ben. Very familiar. Okay, okay. <laughs> so we just met with him uh, a couple of weeks ago. He, he connected with us, and, and uh, we're talking about how we might support each other and potentially collaborate down the road. Um, but it's just great to see the leadership that Ben is showing in that in that space in the UK, and that he's got a you know global view of how their work might um, might be incorporated into uh, or or taken elsewhere outside of the UK. So those those inter international connections are starting to form, and that's really exciting to see because it's very easy to get stuck in your in your bubble. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Trick Music is also doing fantastic work in terms of new technologies mm. and they are doing, uh, they are really trying to connect uh, musicians with possibilities of building instruments mm -hmm. and of adapting mm -hmm. and they have some workshops that they run with uh, lots of people and these are models, right? We, we, we can see that as, wow, this could be applied in a fun way with a lot of different people and with a lot of different organizations. Mm -hmm. So I hope mm -hmm. you can have a great partnership with them. It, it would yeah. be great. Yeah, I hope so too. Uh, and I, and I, I'm, as we talk, I'm still thinking of more people. There's uh, David Bobier who runs a, 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 an organization called Vibra Fusion Lab and they work with Vibro tactile technology. Uh, they're doing some really exciting research and Jesse Stewart, who lives in Ottawa, and uh, he's a percussionist and a professor at the, at the university, at Carleton University, is doing some pretty great research in terms of adaptive instruments and adapting performances uh, for people with various forms of disability and people in the dementia community. Lots of people. Lots uh, of people doing out there. And, great work. And yes. the other thing I would say that's been really exciting is that um, you know, as we as we grow and we develop relationships with new artists, it's been interesting to have conversations with artists who will say, "Yeah, I really I really connect with this uh, with this work because I'm autistic, mm -hmm. right?" And they it may not be in their in their biography, and 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 uh, you know there are issues of of stigma and and uh, you know you would never expect somebody to dic disclose a disability. Um, without having thought about it themselves and, and made that decision. Um, but it's been interesting to, to learn um, that some of the people that we're, we're working with are, are neurodivergent or, or have a disability that they just don't talk about publicly. Um, yeah, so, so I think it'll be interesting to see as we, as we continue to do this work Hopefully, some of that stigma will start to fall away. Uh, people will start to feel more comfortable talking about, about invisible disabilities, invisible forms of disability or neurodivergence, mm -hmm. that, um, so that we can become more comfortable talking about it, which I think is a big part of, the, of this process. Well, thank you so much for your time. My and pleasure. Yeah, and yeah. I, we're, I'm really looking forward to all your projects. Uh, Good luck with everything. Thank you. Yeah, it's there's a lot going on at all times, and it's, as you know, there's a lot to lot of work to do. We've talked. We were just talking about that before we turned our microphones on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to do, but it's definitely exciting to see the growing interest in accessibility and the growing uh, commitment, especially among artists. Mm -hmm. I think um, who just who who have an experience that that opens their eyes to what a concert could be or what a musical experience could be. That's exciting to see. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm.